Hello everybody. Today we're going over how to use a map and specifically focusing on, focusing on topographic maps. So kind of getting into it. The first part that we're going to start with is the features of a topographic map so we can kind of get comfortable with uh, what it looks like and what we're actually seeing when we look at the map. And so let's start off with kind of the basics of the map. Let's look at the colors uh, in a topographic map. So brown is the color that's used for the contour lines and we'll go uh, specifically and talk about contour lines in a few slides but contour lines are basically how we denote elevation and changes in elevation on a topographic map. Blue will be used for lakes, streams, ditches, and anything that's uh, meant to hold water. Uh, red is for your land grids and important roads like uh, large highways will usually be red on a map. Um, smaller roads, trails, railroads, boundaries, those are going to be in black. Um, and then uh, purple will show uh, features updated uh, with aerial photography but not field verified. So if there's something that's in there, um, it's been updated because they could find it on aerial photography, but it hasn't actually, somebody hasn't actually gone there and made sure that's exactly where it is. So that would be purple. You'll also notice that you've got um, white and you've got green. Green is any air, any places where you have um, large amounts of vegetation, whereas your white areas are going to be um, developed areas. So in keeping on with the idea of looking at um, our features, we can, uh, we can look at a topographic map and kind of start piecing together uh, the puzzle. So just going back to kind of our basics, we still have our, our brown contour lines that we're looking at. We have these blue lines, so we know that's going to be some sort of a creek or a stream or something like that. We also have um, our green areas, so our areas of vegetation, and our white areas are areas that are more developed and then we can even get more specific so we can see right here there's little bits of green within the white area so that's going to be a sign of sparse vegetation whereas here down here we have a green area but uh, you notice the contour lines um, leave a big space so we can assume that there's dense vegetation in that area uh, we can look at certain uh, changes in the contour lines, like uh, this right here, and that shows a saddle, so uh, a dip between two ridges. Uh, right here, with these tight contour lines, we see a cliff. Right here, where the contour lines get smaller and lead up to a small circle, that means a peak. We can also see that here. And then if we're going peak to peak here, and we can see, um, we can see this ridge line in between. We also can see a valley here because we know there's a ridge line there and we can see another ridge line here and then we can see that the contour lines get far apart here which indicates a valley. So there's a lot we can figure out by looking at a contour map if we know what we're looking sorry by uh, there's a lot we can figure out by looking at the contours on a topographic map. So when we look at the contour lines, there's a couple big ideas that we want to pick up on. We want to pick up on what an index contour is, what a regular contour line is, and what a contour interval is. And so let's start with the index contour. So if you look at this picture on the left, you'll see that there are darker contour lines and that those darker contour lines have five lines in between them. So if we count between um, 100 and this line right here, we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to get to that line. Now, if I see, and I know that these are evenly spaced, and I'm thinking there's 100 and there's 200, I'm thinking that that's probably going to be 150. Because if I think about it, if there's 10 lines in between 100 and 200, that means that these are all going to be 10 feet apart. So our contour interval for this map is going to be 10. 
and each contour line is going to be 10 feet of elevation change from the other one. So this would be 100, 150, 200, 250, 300 feet of elevation, which means this is 50 feet, which means this is uh, 0 feet of elevation down here. So your contour lines specifically are lines that connect equal points of elevation. So when we look at either of these maps, if we follow this contour line here, that's where it's always going to be that same elevation. So if we look at this map on the right, we see 700 here and 800 as our index contours. Well, if I know that it's five lines in between them, that means it's 100 feet of elevation in five lines. And I know that 100 divided by 5 gives me 20. So my uh, in contour interval for this map on the right is 20. And so I know this is 720. 740, 760, 780, 800. And so anywhere along this line is 720 feet in elevation. And anywhere along this line here is 760 feet in elevation. So now this is what we're going to see quite a bit when we look at um, topographic maps, especially if you work in an area that's very mountainous or very rugged, you're going to see a lot of contour lines. But um, it's really important to just kind of get comfortable. And I really liked like this graphic that I have up here on the screen because it gives you an idea of what to look for. So if we look at number one, it says a flat area where the contours are spaced out. So we can see our contour lines here very widely spaced, especially right here. So that lets us know that we're looking at a relatively flat area. We can also come down here and look at number seven and kind of see a similar thing. Um, number two, so right here it says a steep area contours tightly together, cliffs in this case. And if we look, so we found, so we got a peak here and a peak here, and then we look and we can see that this number one was the contour lines spaced out widely. And so that's a flat area. So then the idea of the contour lines being tight together, that's the opposite of flat. So that's going to be a steep area. Number three, a ridge. Contours bent around the hill. And so when we look at number three here, we can see the contour lines bend around. And all of them just kind of do this bend, same bend around. So you can see that there's a ridge. If I just kind of run my... Um, my cursor up and down here there's a ridge right there you can also see a ridge right there as well number four is going to point us to a valley where the contours are bent back into the hill with a creek in this case and so number four here we can see that creek and we can see the contours bending uh, back in now one of the things um, i was always taught um, with uh, con with uh, topographic maps to really try and get used to is that um, use if you can kind of um, picture uh, letter shapes in your head V's point upstream and U's point downhill. So if we look at our um, we look at this valley that number four is showing us. If we look at all the contour lines. We can see these kind of V's where the point of the V bottom of the V that points us upstream. So if we're so if we're wondering which way downstream is, that's the opposite of the V's, because the V's point upstream. And the U's, so if I look at kind of this ridge line going back to three here, the bottom of the U, that points downhill. And we know that, that that works too, because I can see here's my peak here. And if I just kind of look at all these U's, that's going to point me downhill. Number five points us to a valley pass, so we can see that we know we've got um, we've got a ridge there and we've got a ridge here, but then we see this flat area, but it's still up at elevation, and we know it's up at elevation because here's my index contour at 4,800, and there's my index contour at 5,000, and so we know that's still um, high up compared to 
uh, some of the other spots on this map. So this is actually a valley pass right here. Six, it says the summit. And so that's marked by the X here. And then usually um, if that area has been, uh, has been uh, measured in terms of its elevation, it'll be marked with a specific elevation. So you can see right here, this peak, this specific elevation is 5,525 feet. Whereas this peak over here, pass number seven, is 5,045 feet. Number eight, we've got, or sorry, number seven, we've got a trail, which are dashed single black lines, and the trail number 1315. So this black dashed line right here, that is a trail with the trail number 1315 or 1315. Eight is a road. So that's double black lines and the road number of 115. So right here, there's 115, and it's these double black lines that show us the road. And this road actually connects to um, road number 118 as well. Number nine is a stream with a blue line. So right here, we can see, we see the word south and we see the word west. It might be um, different forks of the same river. And then number 10, we've got a pond or a tarn. Um, pond is probably most likely for, for us to see. And it's just a blue area representing water. So those are, it's a lot of information you can get if you know what you're looking for. So with elevation, I'm going to move myself up here a little bit. With elevation, it's, um, it's really, a good exercise and I've got it um, in the lab assignment that goes with this for you guys to get comfortable with the idea of trying to draw out these uh, slopes to really get you to understand that even though you're looking at flat lines what it actually is representing is a is a slope now these ones because they're spaced out a little bit and we'll get to our uh, egg shape here um, you're going to get a much gentler slope because also we only have one, two, three, four contour lines. So we're not going to get a lot of elevation change in those four contour lines unless our contact contour interval is a very large one. On the left here, with our steep slope, we can see we've got more contour lines. And not only do we have more contour lines, but we have more contour lines closer together, which means we're going to have a much steeper slope. And then the idea of the lines being wider and getting towards smaller and working our way to a peak kind of gives us this idea of working our way towards a peak. And it's longer on this side and shorter on that side. So we're longer here and shorter here. So it's really good to remember that the whole point of a map is taking the 3D world and making it two-dimensional and making it flat. And so it is it is a good exercise every once in a while to think about, even though you're seeing this flat representation, this is actually what you're looking at on that map. All right, so let's talk about map scale because it's a, it's, it's a key subject in trying to understand how to use a map. Okay, and so a map is a, a map is a smaller representation of a large landscape. And so when we have a map scale, we we have um, something that conveys the relationships between objects or the distance between objects. So if I'm looking here at this map, I've got point A and I've got point B, but I need some sort of a relationship to tell me just how far that is when I'm looking at this map. So if I look at this scale down here and I see, oh, okay, this distance here equals six miles. So now when I start looking at this line, I say, okay, well, that's longer than this. So that's going to be, it's going to be longer than six miles. And not only can I get that just good estimate, but now I can also uh, figure out a way to actually measure this and measure this line and get the exact distance that I need, the exact relationship between those two points. And so um, if breaking it down even further, the idea of scale is just the relationship between two measurements. 
And so map scale specifically is the distance on the map um, needed to represent the distance on the ground or the relationship between the map distance and the ground distance. And so um, this, the importance of this and why we need to uh, understand scale is it allows us to estimate the ground distance um, while just looking at a map, not having to actually go out there and do it or being able to plan um, what we need to do before we do it so that that way we're not surprised when we go out there and try and do it, especially since we're going to be out in the woods. There we go. So there's two things you need in terms of a map scale. You're going to need ground distance and you're going to need the map distance. So when we say ground distance, we're talking about the actual distance uh, measured on the ground and then the map distance we're talking about um, what you're going to measure out with um, more than likely a ruler. So usually the easiest ways those are accomplished is somebody's going to go out to an area um, with a GPS. If they're actually working for uh, the United States Geological Service and the ones making these topographic maps, they're going to go out. Uh, they're either going to have uh, professional surveyors or you're going to have some really, um, really expensive, really high-tech uh, GPS equipment to make sure that the measurements are, are accurate and precise. Your map distance, you're just going to be uh, more than likely measuring with a ruler. And the map scales just the relationship between these two. And so we're going to have three different types of scales on topographic maps. We're going to have a graphical scale, an equivalent scale, and a representative fraction or an RF. So here is a map of the state of Georgia and of the national forest in Georgia. And right here we see our three different types of scales. So um, we've got, it says 1 colon 633,600. One inch represents 10 miles. And then we've got uh, these scale bars. So which one's which? So the first one we're going to talk about is the equivalent scale. And so that's this scale right here in the middle. It says one inch represents 10 miles. And so it's an equivalent scale because you have different units of measurement on either side of the scale. So you have one inch and 10 miles. So one inch is represents 10 miles or one inch equals 10 miles. Now, if we're thinking about this and thinking about the fact that it's map distance and ground distance, we're going to make a, a pretty good assumption that the inches or the smaller unit is going to be the map unit and the bigger unit is going to be the actual distance or ground unit um, because it's very easy to measure one inch on a map. It'd be a really, really large map if, it, um, if we had to go measure 10 miles on a map. So your smaller units usually going to be your map units. And so in this case, if we measure one inch on this map, on that map of the National Forest of Georgia, it would, it would be equal or equivalent to 10 miles on the ground. Our graphical scale, move my little picture of me out of the way here. That's going to be this one down here. Now there's two of them. So there's one graphical scale which uh, our unit is miles and then they also have one that's in kilometers because they're different units uh, and it's depending on uh, which one you're using they wanted to make sure there's a graphical scale available for either so we can see that this distance we're going to assume that distance is one inch because we can see that there's the number 10 here and we know our units is our miles so we know from here that one inch equals 10 miles. So I'm going to assume graphically that also that is one inch because that would mean one inch equals 10 miles. Now what's also nice is uh, when you have a graphical scale that they'll break it down into smaller units here. And so I can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different smaller units in there, which means 
if I'm using this graphical scale, I can use this left-hand side, and I'm going to get uh, one tenth of a mile is is small um, as small as I can break it down. So instead of saying something is seven miles, I can use this graphical scale and say it's 7.2 miles or 7.4 miles away. So I can get a, be a little more precise with my measurement. The way you would use a graphical scale on on the map is you would get some um, something else. Like say you didn't have a um, a ruler available to you. You could take a blank piece of paper. You could make uh, tick marks on your blank piece of paper where these different markings were, and then you can use that piece of paper on your map and and use it um, for comparison to be able to come up with estimates. So it's just another way to be able to use the topographic map. Our third scale, move myself out of the way again, is the uh, representative fraction or RF and that's this one that doesn't have any units attached to it. So this scale is unitless. Now it's it's unitless so that you can apply any unit to it. It's not unitless that it's just some weird number that doesn't exist. It's a it's a fraction but that fraction uh, can have um, any units applied to it. You just have to uh, you just have to decide what units you want. And so in this case, let's use inches because inches are very common for us to use on a map. So if we're using inches, the same unit is going to be applied to both sides of that representative fraction. So that means that when I look at this, I'm going to read one inch is equal the comma, uh, sorry, the colon in this, um, in this case, is the same as equals or represents or is equivalent to 633,600 inches. Or the way I want to think about that is one inch on the map is equal to 633,600 inches on the ground. Now, if you say to yourself, well, that's kind of complicated, um, I understand that. But the idea is that, that that scale is unitless. So it's really nice in terms of if I wanted to do it in feet or if I wanted to do it in miles or if I wanted to do it in kilometers, it doesn't matter what unit I pick. That is the right, um, the right representative fraction and I'll be able to apply whatever units make the most sense for me. Now, if I take the 633,600 inches but that doesn't work for me and I'd rather have it in an equivalent scale, I could divide because um, I know it's inches and I want to get it down to say something like feet. I could divide by 12 and then I'd know um, I'd have an equivalent scale of one inch equals um, 52,800 feet. But then I know I want that in miles and I know uh, that if I there's 5,280 feet in one mile, which means that one inch would represent 10 miles. And so if you say to yourself, well, all three of these things are saying the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's the idea. There's only one scale for this map. It's just three different ways to represent that one scale. So um, just kind of going over that example that I just did. So if we want to convert between equivalent scale and representative fraction or representative fraction to equivalent scale, so if I wanted to go back the other way, so one inch equals 10 miles, I'd convert miles to inches. So I'd have to go miles to feet first because it's just easier for me. So 10 miles is equal to 52,800 feet. Uh, 52,800 feet times 12 gives me 633,600 inches. Or one inch would be equal to 633,600 inches. And because I got the same units on both sides, I can basically cancel them out and I get my unit list 1 to 633,600 representative fraction. So if we look to do the same thing, so on a map, straight line between two road intersections equals 4.3 inches. So I measured that. I took out my map. I said, okay, here's a straight line between 
let's call it road intersection A and road intersection C. I measure it with a ruler, it's 4.3 inches. But I know based on, um, based on what I found out in the field, when I went and did that same distance, that it was 86 chains in the field. Well, now I can come up with the scale of my map because I know that I measured 4.3 inches on this map that I either made or I just don't know the scale of. And I know in the field it was 86 inches. So if I say 4.3 inches equals 86, sorry, 86 chains, 4.3 inches equals 86 chains, I can break that down. I know that um, that in terms of I can go chains to feet pretty easy, which is um, 66 feet in a chain. And then I know I can go from um, feet to inches pretty easy. And if I break that down, what I'm eventually going to get to is 1 inch equals 20 chains. And so if I wanted to put that, so once I got to 1 inch equals 20 chains, that's the equivalent scale. Now, 4.3 inches equals 86 chains is also an example of an equivalent scale. However, it makes um, much more sense if we're trying to use a map that we would want to have um, a more standardized um, map unit. And so something like one inch or one uh, centimeter or some sort of more standardized map unit always makes the, the scale uh, come out be uh, better looking in my mind. Uh, in terms of a representative fraction, if we know that one inch equals 20 chains, we're going to try and get that those to the same units. So I'm going to keep my inch and I know 20 chains. I can multiply or divide that. Um, I can do, sorry, I can multiply 20 by 66 because there's 66 feet in a chain. Gets me to 1320. Multiply that by 12 because I know there's 12 inches in um, a foot and that gets me to 15,840 inches on the ground. So that means my representative fraction for this is going to be 1 to, uh, to 15,840. Let's look at it again. So if we've got 7.3 inches on our map and we've got 11.5 miles on the ground, if we're going to do an equivalent scale, um, we could just say 7.3 inches equals 11 and a half miles, but it'd be much better to get it to 1 inch. So we're going to do we break it all the way down and that becomes 1 inch equals 1.58 miles. Now if we wanted to get the representative fraction for that, 1 inch equals 1.58 miles, we do 1.58 times 5,280 which gets us to feet and then times 12 which gets us to inches and we come up with an RF of 1 to 99,814. So now let's look at it another way. So our map scale, our representative fraction that we're going to use is 1 to 24,000, which is the standard um, representative fraction for uh, USGS topologi uh, topological quad maps or topo maps. Our map distance is 3.21 inches. So how far is this on the ground? So this is probably the more common way you're going to use a map. You're going to get a map, you're going to see the scale, and then you're going to measure something on the map and then figure out how far that is on the ground so you can then go um, check it on the ground or go do whatever you're going to do out there in the field. And so one of the things I want to do is I, if I've already am measuring on my map in inches, then I know for my units, for my unit list number here, I want to use inches. And so I'm going to say 1 inch is equal to 24,000 inches because for that representative fraction, which is unit list, I just need to make sure I put the same unit on both sides. So 1 inch equals 24,000 inches. And so now I know, though, that I'm going to be dealing with 3.21 inches. So 3.21 inches, if this is 1 inch equals 24,000 inches, I know I just have to multiply this side by 3.21, and that gives me 3.21 inches, both sides, sorry, I multiplied both sides by 3.21, and so I get 3.21 inches equals 7,040 inches. Well, now, 
I know that if I wanted to figure it out in feet on the ground, I've got it in inches on the ground. I just need to get it to feet. So I know if I take this number and I get it to feet, which I'm going to divide by 12 inches because I know that I want it in feet, then 3.21 inches on the map is going to be equal to 6,420 feet on the ground. Now, if I wanted to get that in miles, I could um, divide it out again by 5,280. Or if I wanted to get it in chains, I could divide it out by 66 again and get it into whatever unit I need to make it easiest for me to find it in the field. So another thing we need to figure out when we're looking at maps is this idea of large scale versus small scale maps. So when we look at these two numbers right here, these two unit list representative fractions, we have 1 to 100,000 and 1 to 24,000. So which one to you is larger? Because it's the one thing to remember is it is a fraction number. So when we're saying 1 to 100,000, we're also saying 1 over or 1 divided by 100,000 and 1 over 24,000 or 1 divided by 24,000. So when we look at it, 1 to 100,000 is 0 0.00001. 1 to 24,000 is 0 0.0000416. Okay, so 1 to 24,000 is actually a large scale map. 1 to 100,000 is a small scale map. But we see big numbers and we immediately think large. But this big number is on the bottom of our fraction, which means we're dividing by more, which means it's going to be a smaller number. So what a 1 to 24,000 uh, topo map would be classified as a large scale map, whereas a 1 to 100,000 uh, scale map would be a small scale map. And so just kind of giving you a glance at that. So this would be a small scale map where we're getting a lot, um, a lot less detail. Like this is the whole city of Glasgow, Scotland. Whereas this large scale map, um, we are, we're seeing buildings, we're seeing streets, we're, we're really down into a city and seeing the city in detail. Here we're looking at, um, you know, almost a huge chunk of Scotland, whereas here we're looking at one street and some houses specifically. So large scale, we're going to see detail and we're going to be, um, it's a large amount of detail on a small land area. Small scale is going to be small amount of detail on a large land area. So large scale versus small scale. So small scale, large amount of area, Sorry, small scale, small amount of detail, large land area. Large scale, large amount of detail, small area. And so just trying to put this whole thing back together, here is a, um, here's a topographic map. Now if you want to pause it and click this link to Google Maps, you can see what how Google Maps represents the same area um, that you see on this topographic map, just to give you kind of an, uh, a more of a picture view of it and a different kind of map view of it. But just some of the different things that we've talked about. We've talked about um, declination before um, in a previous lecture, and here's the declination uh, for this specific map. So if I was going to use this specific map, I want to make sure that I set my declination. Uh, on my compass to this, if I'm going to use this map to make sure it, it matches up correctly. Here's our scales. So here's our representative fraction, standard for uh, standard one and twenty-four thousand for a USGS topo map. Here are three different graphical scales: one in miles, one in feet, and one in kilometers. It tells us our contour interval on this map is twenty feet. So anytime we see a contour line, and then another contour line we know that they're going to be 20 feet apart. Now, um, looking at our contour lines, we also notice that the contour lines are kind of far apart. So we know we're looking at probably pretty flat land for the most part. Still up at a decent elevation, though. Here is a 3,400 uh, in, uh, index contour, and I see this next line here. 
Now, we talked about the idea of the use point downhill. So I'm going to, if this is 3,400, my contour interval is 20, I'm going to assume this is 3,380 and 3,360. And if I follow this one around, I see right there it says 3,360. So pretty good. Sounds good. Sometimes you'll get these known elevations where people have measured um, measured the elevation. And so that's also helpful. Here we see the um, some dashed black lines, so we know we're dealing with a, a road or a trail. Um, hopefully you'll have a legend on the map, um, probably more than likely over to the right-hand side of the map, that will explain uh, exactly what those, those dots mean. We can see we've got a big interstate here, so it's in red. We know that the green areas we talked about, those are dense. Um, those have much more vegetation. The white areas are going to be developed areas. We've got blue, which are going to represent our, um, our lakes, or sorry, our streams or rivers or creeks. And we've got, uh, this, these blue areas representing ponds or, um, or lakes. We've got some different symbology here. Now, um, topographic maps have a lot of symbology to them, and there's always usually going to be, uh, some sort of a legend or some sort of an explanation that goes with it. There are specific handouts um, that explain all the different um, features that you might find within a topographic map. Uh, we can see this area right here, it's got these little hash marks in it, and that's actually going to indicate a depression so that even though th this is um, at this elevation, these little hash marks inside of that elevation means that what's inside of that uh, contour actually decreases in elevation instead of um, increasing. So it's just another little thing to pick up on. But lots of information that we can pick up for uh, on when we're looking at these topographic maps. And then on the outside here, we've got our um, state plane coordinates. We've got our adjoining um, quadrangles. We've got our uh, UTM coordinates. We've got our latitude and longitude. Lots of information to help us figure out where we are and what's there.